so these are risk closures related to work we've done as an investigator in a myocardial recovery trial. I'm gonna talk briefly about that. Uh, I was a primary investigator along with Emma Burks in this Thoratex sponsored, now Abbott. So, uh, so I definitely have that as a disclosure. Um, also with other LVAT trials, I was an investigator, uh, regional uh, primary investigator for the, um, you know, hardware now is no longer used, but the Medtronic um, uh, VAD. Uh, and I was the national co-PI with Bob France uh, in the Soprano trial looking at Massey Tent and post LVAT, which I'm not gonna talk about. So I'm just gonna start by talking about, this is a slide from Dr. Chatterjee, uh, one of our mentors. Also, Dr. Guys, one of the cardiologists that taught me as much uh, as anyone when I was a young uh, attending at UCSF. And, and what Dr. Chatterjee wanted to give in this, in, this, in this slide is just, I mean, look at all the different phenotypes that add up to or beget heart failure. And, and what I'm going to try to make the case here for is that, you know, you have many, many disease states. Dr. Bud Frazier calls them afflictions because he's more of a poet than most of us. Uh, from Texas, um, but I'm gonna say that many disease states, like thousands, right? I mean, that, unfortunately, that's what heart failure is. You, you ultimately can't figure out why someone has heart failure a good percentage of the time, but ultimately, a set of adaptations that are limited to heart failure, which those determine how the patient does. So as heart failure docs, we have to understand those adaptations. I'm gonna try to give you a couple nuances about that today. And one of the important things is look at the body. Look at the body's response to a failing heart is the most important thing you can do when you begin to uh, evaluate a patient. I mean, don't, don't focus on the echo as much. Um, I'll say whenever I meet a patient in the clinic, I try to kind of try to start a database by myself. I, I try it. It's hard because, it, you know, you're so busy, you want to look at other people's notes and, and have some idea. But, but I really have gotten better at just asking the patient and their family, what's going on in their perspective. Because again, many disease states and many expressions of a syndrome, but you have to figure out what you're gonna do with the patient. So again, all, I mean, we're talking about every single organ's affected by heart failure. It's impressive how tied these mechanisms are. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is metabolism. Cardiac cachexia for me is so under, underrated as a risk factor. I mean, one of the most important things you can do in a, for a patient is, because um, they may not remember what they weighed when they were healthy, if they were even chronically ill. So one of the things that you should do, that I do, is I pull up their license. I say, give me your license. Let me see what your license, what you looked like a couple years ago. Uh, often the license, and, and you would be amazed when someone's really ill, how different they look, and you begin to see the real affliction of heart failure coming through. So again, we have a progressive syndrome, and one of the things that should be appreciated about this syndrome is that, you know, you have a wasting, process that is related to a constant catecholamine excess in the setting of stress. What's the stress? Your heart's failing. Uh, that's just, that's a stressor. And we know that that happens in these patients. Um, and one of the things that we began to um, talk about when I was a fellow, because this is when this came out uh, around that time, I was a fellow at Hopkins 2003, is okay, so how do you organize a set of therapies for patients that have really bad heart failure. So we have Dr. Jessup and Dr. Brzezina, colleagues of Dr. Guy and myself that were actually in Pennsylvania with us. And, and these guys actually really, you know, they came up with something that was important, which is, okay, start thinking about it in terms of, okay, the sicker the patient, the more therapeutic intent you're gonna have. It makes sense. You should always spare the patient things they don't need, always. So, so this step up hype, this is a step up kind of paradigm, right? Okay, well, you start with, when I was training, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers were just beginning to literally not so much creep in, but I mean, the clinical trials were really getting strong and people still couldn't believe we were using beta blockers for heart failure in 2000, in, when I trained in 1997 to 2000. Um, I was really um, happy to have been blessed to have been with someone who really took me under his wing when I was a resident, Mark Drasner and Clyde Yancey, and, um, and they were just exemplary teachers. You know, they were all about the science, but they were really, you know, just clinicians who knew that uh, their patients needed their attention. So, um, so again, what's happened now, fast forward, that's 17 years ago. So fast forward to 2020, and now 2023, too much has happened. And one of the most important things that's happened is we don't have a step up anymore. So that step up is you're like, okay, well, wait a minute. Why are you adding the SGLT2 when you've got an, you haven't even maximized the candesartan or the ACE inhibitor? We don't have that anymore. Now we have 
and I'll talk a little bit about that. So what's, what's the role of cardiac contractility modulation, which is beginning to be proven to some degree. Um, it's interesting, the role's still questionable as far as, you know, for everybody. Um, but, but we started having also um, baroreceptor stimulation, which I'll talk only briefly about. So, so the idea is, well, well, my God, you know, how many steps and when do you do it and what's the right thing? So, so think of it more like a pillars and I'm so glad I think this was again with, the, with Dr. Yancey and others in the, most, in the guidelines maybe about seven years ago. They had to say, well, it's more like pillars. You know, you have this incredible, you know, you know call it a, a huge, you know, foundational roof that you need, to, you need to support the patient. So these pillars are the supportive structures of the patient. And we'll start with ASARB, neprilysin inhibitor. Sometimes I like to call that one pillar, ASARB ARNI. But anyway, it's a separate pillar here, beta blocker, MRA, and SGLT2 inhibitor. So the pillars now give us a sense that basically you could take a patient from a stage like C, get them out of heart failure into stage B. So they have structural disease. You did not cure them of their heart failure, but they're decongested. And like Dr. Guy said, you've gotten them to a point where you see them in clinic, you can't tell they have heart failure. <laughs> And that's important. They have a heart that's failing, but they, you can't tell that when you're in clinic. Now, underlying another paradigm here, and I'm gonna delve into this a little bit. I talked with Dr. Samady, um, uh, you know, last night at dinner, and um, Dr. Henry and, uh, and, uh, and Jamie, uh, we were talking about the fact that, you know, metabolism is really construed so far, it has been construed really focused on obesity. And, and it should be, the US, first world, third world now is, I mean, it's just an incredible issue of diet-induced obesity that we have and how to understand the effects. Think of heart failure as a reverse metabolic syndrome because we evolved to keep our weight stable through many mechanisms like leptin. When you're losing weight, something's happening. What's happening? You're mobilizing lipids. Well, what's that doing? That can be lipotoxic to some organs. And that was one of the theories, this lipotoxicity from Mobilization of fat was one of the things that was really capturing people in the early 2000s. And I trained at Parkland where there was incredible scientists working on this, like Dr. Unger, uh, Dr. McGarry. The whole fear of insulin resistance because of skeletal muscle fat deposition came from these brilliant people. And they thought everything was about fat, everything. So I began to take interest in that as a very young trainee. And I'm glad I did because we did some work that may have helped the field. I'll, show, I'll share that with you a little bit. But this, is, this was a uh, review that, I, this was an editorial I did for a circulation paper that captured that lipotoxicity was present in heart failure. And when you put an LVAD in, meaning that there was excess fat in the heart, you had these droplets, these lipid droplets uh, that you could actually, so right here, you can actually see excess lipid if you actually looked at the, at the micrographs of a, of a heart in cross section. So, Quick primer on metabolism. Just as I, I'm doing this honestly to be on the same page about what we did so I can really simplify really about six to eight years of work we did at Penn um, with a really wonderful colleague, uh, Ken Margulies. Um, the whole idea of metabolism is all about capturing, you know, how does a cell maintain its environment safely with, 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 uh, you know, within, within, within an environment that's changing, how does it stay safe? You talk about cells, organs, organisms. And basically, the important thing about muscle is, and the heart muscle, is that the heart is cycling 12 times its weight daily of ATP. Just think about that for a minute. It is actually cycling, it's not making, it's cycling 12 times its weight daily of ATP. That's, that's crazy. Um, it's crazy, right? But that is what it's doing, your heart every day. How does it do it? Well, it has to be fed, so it's taking substrates, it's converting them, and then it's actually translating that conversion into a common dollar currency, which is um, acetyl-CoA, a little bit of a reminder from biochemistry, and that acetyl-CoA gets transferred, and you make ATP from that in many ways. But the bottom line, what happens here is, important thing about this is that the heart, in most mammals, I think, and then this is mammalian physiology is, so adaptive to change. So it can actually seesaw between glucose, fatty acids, and I'm gonna show you the ketone hypothesis. So why does it have to seesaw? Because you're a human. <laughs> you have to starve sometimes, you have to fast, and you better be able to seesaw or you're gonna be, or your heart's gonna run out of energy, right? So Dr. Tagmeyer's talked about this remarkable flexibility of the heart's metabolism. That's a normal heart. 
A failing heart is less flexible. I'll show you that. So Hans Krebs was the mentor of Dr. Tagmeier. This is Hans Krebs right here. I know this is a very old picture uh, at Trinity College, Oxford, all these professors. This guy, I think one of these guys is like an evolutionary biologist. But here's Dr. Krebs, who got the Nobel Prize for medicine or physiology for, for the Krebs cycle. Um, and, and he honestly left Germany. He was a Swiss. He was a, an investigator in Germany, and he came to England. And a lot of his discoveries were done um, in Germany and England. So basically, so what, so what do you mean by seesaw? All right, so here is a postprandial, right? So you're actually about, you know, despite the fact that the heart in its basal state really has an ability to burn fatty acids very stably and keep its metabolism going, after you fast, you will, it'll take up glucose, it'll make, uh, it'll oxidize, and, and you'll make energy from that. And you'll decrease the free fatty acids um, in the heart, just because, again, you have a total balance of one system, one substrate competing with the other. Fasted overnight, glucose drops. What else drops? Insulin. When insulin drops, you mobilize fatty acids like crazy. Thank God. Otherwise, we'd be, all of us would, would weigh incredible amounts if it wasn't for that mechanism. So triglycerides, free fatty acids, oxidized energy. This is what happens in every human every day. Then, so it's a seesaw, right? It's a seesaw fed, fasted, and you go into a whole Krebs cycle that transforms acetyl-CoA to reducing equivalents, and then you get ATP in the mitochondria. That's the, that's the machinery. Every, every day, every hour. This is an interesting uh, paper. It began, I, I was looking for one of the early papers that began to question whether or not, okay, so what happens in the failing heart? How come we don't know what the hell's going on? When you look at a failing heart, you get a biopsy of it, sometimes nothing, nothing's going on. It looks actually quite, it, let's just say it's not normal, but it's not that abnormal. You have someone dying in front of you. So this is one of the questions these guys were asking. So they started measuring metabolites in the heart. This is something that fast forward, several of us would do in failing hearts. This is the uh, laboratory in Galveston of George Herman and Dr. Deschard. So what did they find? They found creatine to be deficient amongst, and creatine's very important for a translation into ATP, uh, ultimately in the heart. So, so, so the question was, do we have fat in the heart in excess because we're mobilizing lipids, either because of diet-induced obesity or because of heart failure? I told you about heart failure also being a wasting syndrome. Or do we have a starved heart? That was a question we asked. And I began working on this with Ken Margulies in 2009. At UCSF, we actually collected samples and began to look at fat in the heart because we had some money, and um, I had a wonderful fellow who's actually now an attending up at the University of North Carolina. Brian was working with me and uh, Paul Simpson, and we couldn't believe the results, and in fact, I didn't publish them because I thought they were too unbelievable, which is there was no fat in the heart. I said, we can't be doing this right, the stains are wrong, because I, I, I grew up believing that lipotoxicity would be a mechanism of failure. So we didn't publish it. So fast forward, I'm at Penn, I bring this hypothesis with me. I'm talking to Ken Margulies. We have the best. If you ever want to have a, a repository, Dr. Margulies, since Temple's been collecting samples with many surgeons, he's got three, 400 failing, 600 non-failing. So if anyone wants to do basic work or even translational work on samples that are available, he's extremely collaborative. Dr. Guy knows him and I, and they're an amazing colleague, uh, heart failure physician at Penn right now. So what do we do? I wanted to look at this at the level of spectroscopy. So somebody at Penn led me to a guy named Ian Blair, who was an oncologist and pharmacologist who was doing incredible tissue work looking at lipid species. The whole lipidomic work began to really allow us to really say, okay, did I, did I mess up those or, or, or were we right even at UCSF looking at these uh, stains? So we took cores from an LVAD. So LVAD cores give you failing tissue. We also had non-failing hearts. And we did a very simple, um, I didn't have paired samples, I couldn't tell the effects of the LVAD with the transplanted heart. So we, we just took a sample of these, and what did we find? We found, so this is a mirror plot, looking at p-values and significance, and, and, and what's important is red means you've, you've got deficiency, you've got a relative decrease or an abundance of lipid species. Green means that these lipid species are in increased abundance. Very clearly, there's decreased abundance of lipid species here. I mean, it, it, it stands out. So the first question was, okay, that's interesting. We still have some lipid species that are increased. So, what, so what, what stood out here? If you actually looked, 
The acyl carnitines, which are the energetic lipids that fatty acids are needing to go to, were absolutely horribly, if I, you ask me, this was something shocking to me. In fact, I didn't believe this, so I repeated the experiment as well before we published this. I said, my God, the control were non-failing donor hearts that were not used, right? So you have a donor heart that maybe not used for reasons that are related to high risk factors. Some of the donor hearts were not normal. So that's why I say non-failing. Um, look at the variability in the lipid. Here, not only are the lipid species low, there, there's no variability. It's like, what? I mean, this, was a, this, was like, this is a completely different organism, right? A different organ. I've never seen this kind of, uh, and, and neither did Dr. Blair, who was kind enough to really give me his expertise, you know, his works in cancer with lipids and metabolism. He said, this is crazy, uh, this result. And I said, probably isn't true. <laughs> Let's repeat the experiment. So anyway, my poor, uh, not postdoc, we hired somebody named Ken Beatty, who was also the person doing work in our lab, uh, was really eager to publish. And an extra three years later, we were able to publish this. But bottom line is we, we looked at this. So, so, we, so the fatty acyl carnitine are the ones that are basically labeled for easy entry into the mitochondria so they can then go into this cycle to make the acetyl-CoA. Right, and then that's the common, that's the dollar, the common currency for making energy in organs is acetyl-CoA. So, um, so what happened? We finally published this and what we found was the same thing. This is a, this is a heat map. Uh, you see non-failing and failing. And again, this is the lipid species being confirmed by a postdoc who's now an attending at Drexel, at Temple, uh, Nate Snyder. And a PhD, um, he basically identified these are completely, I mean, the failing heart is like a desert of lipids. I mean, you see blue, higher intensity red. Um, and again, look at that. Here is a reproduction of that now in about 20 samples. This time I took explanted failing hearts. So we had the whole heart, obviously not the whole heart. We had, you know, vials that Dr. Margulies allowed us to look into and we reproduced this and found this. So the interesting part about this is we found something else and I talked about it yesterday. This was surprising to me and Dr. Snyder actually is the one to credit for looking at this. And he said to me, something's not right about the um, ketone metabolism in the heart. I said, well, I don't know much about it, but I know that you know, the ketone metabolism is really relevant to the liver, right? Liver's made by, the ketones are made by liver. He said, no, there's some signal of increased hydroxybutyl CoA in the heart. I said, what does that mean? He said, the heart's probably doing something with ketones. So that's all he told me. So we started, so we measured in the heart versus the serum. Now it was already known since the 1990s that heart failure patients actually have excess ketosis. Mild, but excess. That's, believe it or not, studies that went back, breath studies with ketones, even blood studies showed that. This is circulation jack papers that identified and they postulated why I think they were wrong postulating why. Uh, I'll tell you their reasoning later, but um, I think it made a lot more sense once we found this, which is the heart is using ketones. Here you have excess ketones in the blood and you have a deficiency of myocardial hydroxybutyrate compared to control. So if you have more ketone circulating and less in the heart, you're utilizing. That's kind of a rough way to do something, some kinetics that we couldn't do at that time. All right, so then we said, well, what's happening? the heart's reprogramming itself to use ketones. And this was exciting. This was exciting because at the same time, there was actually a basic scientist named, he's also a wonderful cardiologist, Dr. Kelly. Dan Kelly was actually exactly doing this work in mice, in attack plus MI model, uh, transiotic constriction plus MI model. He was demonstrating that these hearts were uh, utilizing, were upregulating their ketone metabolism, the ketolysis. And this is what we found uh, these enzymes are extremely like, hard to regulate. So this is the rate limiting state of ketone metabolism. Why, why is that important? I mean, a lot of us believe it's because your brain needs ketones under starvation mechanisms. So, so it's a probably very preserved, um, you know, very preserved uh, is the ability for organs to shift metabolism into a ketone state. In fact, a lot of the investigators doing physiology you know, exercising rats, uh, even doing uh, biopsies, skeletal muscle biopsies on humans, it's a very rare thing to see ketone metabolism revved up uh, in muscle because it's a very, let's just say ketones can circulate and they can be taken up like that for, for fuel. 
But if you don't have a way to process it, you know, the ketones still remain in the blood. So basically what we found was revved up ketone metabolism. And now, now our theory that we kind of put forth, I mean, the theory that we put forth about a starving myocardium, which wasn't ours in terms of credit alone. We had more evidence for it, but it went back to even studies being done at Oxford with cardiac MRI, looking at the um, cycling of ATP. They found that the failing heart is deficient in its cycling of ATP, despite having, um, again, you know, uh, all kinds of adaptive mechanisms, a human heart, it's failing to cycle a daily amount of ATP that it needs to survive. It makes sense. It, it's, it's running out of fuel. If you remember that New England Journal of Medicine, uh, for those of you guys that may have seen an incredible review by Dr. Um, Stefan Neubauer at, at, at Oxford, he called it an engine out of fuel. And, and that is, I think that's a good way to put the failing heart. That's what we, I mean, that's what we all do as cardiologists, as cardiac team, cardiac surgeons. We, we, we try to make the heart more efficient. If you don't do that, the heart's just gonna keep failing. I mean, that makes sense to all of us. Um, so here is, the idea is that maybe a therapeutic intervention, so we have non-uniform adaptations of metabolism in the failing heart. Maybe you have a diabetic patient with HEFPEF. I didn't study that. That's probably very different than this. These were all myopaths, dilated, and I studied lean non-diabetics so I could, I could see a clean signal of heart failure. A lot of these people were young that we had samples from at the time of transplant. And then what we talked about, this is what I'm putting here is, so you have a depleted pool of acyl carnitines, you have a disruption of the Krebs cycle, we showed that the acetyl-CoA was bottlenecked. You couldn't cycle enough acetyl-CoA and a reliance on ketones. And then the, the, the idea, and I'm presenting this really for 10 minutes, is this may be a way for us to move forward to assist the heart, to assist the patient in adapting to heart failure. So GLP-1. So now I'm gonna, with that background, I'm going to show you how to explain some of the results of clinical trials that for me are very important for a good internist to know and a good cardiologist. So GLP-1 in heart failure, I wouldn't use it. <laughs> in conclusion, and I'm, I'm talking about only one trial. The FIGHT trial was a heart failure network trial, really well done by my partner, Dr. Margulies. Tom Coppola was also doing this work. They wrote the study for the network. And I can tell you, everybody was really excited, 2005, 2006, oh my God. GLP-1, you make insulin resistance better. That means the heart can use energy better. Watch what happens here. So they went ahead and did a randomized trial of patients that were like recently hospitalized or even they recruited even within hospitalization, the latter part, these patients. So sick patients, high pro-BNP in the 2000s. And it was a, so, they, so, so again, this was just the background for this. There was already evidence from pilot studies that, oh, you could improve the ejection fraction with GLP-1. You know, be careful of pilot studies that are suggestive. You have to, you have to do the definitive randomized study if you're gonna change practice, right? So they talked about GLP-1 as a sustained therapy in a post-acute heart failure setting. They get placebo versus loriglutide once a month, that injection. And they went ahead and did 90-day, six-minute walks, KCCQ and biomarkers. And then obviously they looked at mortality. Um, and, and, and basically they did a rank. So the rank means that you basically have all these outcomes and you put points to them. And in this case, remember, the higher, so the most favorable um, is, is a higher score, okay? So you get this score, all these patients are ranked in terms of first to next event. And what they showed is no difference with, again, a lower score, a higher score for the placebo. But importantly, if you look at the hospitalization, you know, you had an increase of 6%, so 53 patients were hospitalized in the loriglutide compared to placebo, that's a signal. And again, this was presented at the, uh, uh, at the I think in, at the AHA, uh, Kenny presented this, then published in JAMA. Here is the freedom from heart failure related hospitalization or death, and you see a signal towards worsening events with loriglutide. And finally, if you separate adverse events, you also had a signal with worsening renal function, that wasn't significant. And finally, if you, there was a diabetics that were maybe hit a little bit more. I may be wrong about this, but I'm gonna give you my theory why this is true. It's, I think it's very simple if you, if, 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 the, <laughs> if you think that the adaptations in metabolism for heart failure come from basic human evolutionary adaptations, which I think they have to be, right? You can't just recreate a human when they have heart failure. <laughs> they come from all the, all the thousands of years that we evolved. What you're doing with loriglutide is what? 
you are making the heart more sensitive and the other organs more sensitive to insulin. So what happens there? You are breaking, you're putting a break on free fatty acid oxidation. That, that's what you're doing in the fat cell. So obviously you're losing weight, there's other mechanisms by which you lose weight, not lipolysis. So you are basically cutting off free fatty acids in a starving myocardium. That's I think what's going on. That's why I think some patients when they're sicker should not be given GLP-1. In fact, this is my practice because um, I see patients as a third, fourth consultant. I will take patients off GLP-1 when I see them in clinic if I try to get a history of the timing when they started GLP-1, especially when they're losing weight because of cardiac cachexia. I mean, they don't need it anymore, right? So I will take patients off GLP-1. And I think the companies which are very powerful are clearly upset about this result. They've not really talked about it much, but I would use GLP-1 for pre-heart failure, stage A, risk factor modification, what Dr. Burkle does in the metabolism program, very important. But in heart failure, give me at least one more trial. And uh, I, I, I mean, I, I'm convinced I would, I would be careful with advanced heart failure patients getting GLP-1. Okay, so how about SGLT-2? So, so why, I just told you what I think. Um, I think insulin resistance in this case is actually guilty by association. I think insulin resistance is metabolic adaptation in heart failure. So when you see a patient with an A1C, that's 7.58, and you ask them, when did you get diabetes? Same time I got heart failure. I've asked that every patient of mine. A lot of patients coincide their diabetes with heart failure. Is that just coincidence? Or you're like, oh, they probably had diabetes for 10 years before. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe they've got heart failure and insulin resistance as an adaptive mechanism to allow this heart to mobilize, to, to get the fuel it needs it could be a human adaptation. So anyway, so then SGLT2 comes in. What happens to SGLT2? You're peeing glucose, ultimately, because of the inhibition on the, on, the, on, these, on the tubule. When you pee glucose, you have to have some drop relative in, in, uh, in glucose in the blood. Maybe it's not consistent, but what happens next? You drop insulin levels. They have to drop, and that is actually known, and I'll show you also some data on ketones here. Insulin levels drop. Free fatty acids get revved up, ketones come up, and now you have a winner. Now you have a winner of a winner, <laughs> right? I mean, we haven't had a drug like SGLT2 for about, since the beta blocker, if you ask me. You know, I think it's that important. So anyway, I just summarized that right there. Um, we had already data on SGLT2 lowering blood pressure. This was exciting for the drug companies that were developing diabetes products. They're like, oh wow, effect on blood pressure, crazy. Um, so we, now we know all the story about cardiovascular health. This is important. There's weight loss in type 2 diabetes with SGLT2 that's got to do with, by DEXA scan, they showed a reduction of total body weight, mainly total body fat mass. Why? Probably insulinemia drops, and you are, you're off to the races, hydrolyzing fat. Now, it's not a weight loss reduction pill. I wish, I wish it could do more for obese patients. I don't think it does. You can ask Dr. Burkle about that. But it certainly will give you... Um, a more facile uh, way to, uh, you know, to mobilize free fatty acids. So again, the rest is history, DAPA-HF, I'm not gonna go through this, but the number needed to treat in these trials to use an SGLT2 is anywhere from 15 to 20, and that's impressive. That's impressive because all these patients were really well treated with beta blockers, et cetera, et cetera. Dr. Crawford is a basic scientist, uh, MD, PhD, he's brilliant. He worked with Dan Kelly in the lab when he was at WashU, and uh, Dr. Crawford, I'll just credit him, came to visit us when I was at Penn, he was really excited about some of the data we generated. He's an amazing ketone scientist, and I think he's also convinced that the mechanism of SGLT2 for benefit could be this ketone hypothesis, which is basically, again, you have the idea that you're generating ketone bodies, because what I said, you're generating, um, you're, you're breaking down more free fatty acids, and the ketone bodies are being generated by the liver. You know how I told you about the ATP generation in the heart? In the liver, I learned this from, uh, I forgot if it's Dr. Foster, somebody taught me this, but I think it's true. Uh, I think Dr. McGarry um, at UT Southwestern, the liver can generate, I think, half its weight or its weight in ketone metabolism when you rev it up, when the free fatty acids are flowing through the body, i.e. in starvation. I mean, that, that, that's crazy, right? Another crazy organ, heart and liver. <laughs> uh, liver tastes better, I think, right? Anyway, um, all right. That's a terrible thing for me to say. So I can tell you that, um, so ketones in SGLT2 are, you definitely are, you can, you can measure it yourself. 
Most patients have a sustained ketosis. It can be variable, and it's important for you to know if you're checking you know, hydroxybutyrate in some panel of admissions, could be the SGLT2, um, and it's very much reproducible across, this is in, this is canagliflozin, um, and this is epigliflozin. And what's interesting is in those patients with type 2 diabetes that have sustained, that have been on SGLT2, look at the bump at the zero time. This is minutes down here. Look at the bump at the zero time um, that you see in the, in the, in the ketone, uh, I'm sorry, this is not in minutes, this is, this is days. Look at the bump when you're giving uh, when you're reintroducing the SGLT2 um, in those patients as far as the, um, the hydroxybutyrate. Just briefly, I'm not sure what's happening in HFPEF. It's such a different beast, but it's nice to know that SGLT2s have some important role in HFPEF, and I think it's important to take your patients through that are non-diabetic HFPEF patients an education about using a drug like SGLT2. Teach them about the fact that you're not gonna lower their glucose. You can help decongest them, and I use it. I use it for my HFPEF patients um, and more to come. There's probably more data coming on this as well. So I'm just going to briefly talk about this. This is a quick, um, I was talking to Dr. Shamity about this, a, a translational work that we're trying to do because of COVID and because we've gotten really busy at Jefferson because life gets busy. We've not been able to move forward with this translational work, but we are currently testing whether a ketone ester drink called Delta G developed by a colleague of ours, Kieran Clark at Oxford. So Delta G, and she actually did Patent the Gibbs, unbelievable, huh? Because now it's patented. Uh, so she patented, she made a, a ketone ester drink called Delta G, and uh, it gives you a reproducible ketosis. By taking a ketone ester that actually gets absorbed in a small intestine, they figured out the pharmacology. She got a grant from the uh, army. She got a DARPA grant because the idea was, can we make our soldiers more fit, more able to withstand physical uh, endurance uh, challenges. And so Delta G was developed and lo and behold, it got tested, published, got tested in elite athletes. Elite athletes can't, Im can't improve their best on any given day by more than, you know, half a percent. I mean, these are elite athletes maxing out. With Delta G, you had a reproducible improvement of their best time, uh, you know, doing erg, ergometry and all those things that they did, these guys. Um, so we hypothesized with Kieran and are still trying to do this study years later. I got a grant at Penn to do it in 2017, and it's just been one thing after another, including when I left Penn, trying to get this study off the ground, but I think we're gonna finally do it. Um, the idea is, if you give exogenous ketone ester, can you help the heart? Can you find a signal for improvement in the heart? And the idea is that the failing heart, remember I told you the failing heart starving of energy, and the failing heart is basically, you know, under conditions of heart failure, you're mobilizing free fatty acids, which the heart needs for energy, but you know what's interesting is the free fatty acids also have an effect on the heart by uncoupling in the mitochondria. The, there's also a deleterious effect of too much free fatty acid. So what ultimately happens is, you know, so bring in the ketones and what happens, now you have energy and you're also decreasing the entry of free fatty acids into the heart, interestingly. It's a competitive mechanism. If you have ketones, your heart says, I don't need your free fatty acids. Does that make sense? So you have that kind of balance. So to test this hypothesis, we wanted to do a, um, a clinical trial crossover using cardiopulmonary exercise test and also using echo as a modality. And more to come, maybe I'll send some results to Dr. Uh, Guy will present my Inca heart failure study and use it in cardiac surgery to help acute patients uh, get through uh, surgery with ketones. I think ketones are vastly underused, understudied in translational medicine. I hope somebody takes the, uh, somebody here, take the, you know, we're all getting old. Take the, uh, take the flag. Uh, I think it's a very important thing that we can study. And you've got a lot of smart people. Dr. Tagmeyer, who is with Dr. Krebs, he's still alive. He's in Texas. I think he's 78 years old, still comes in every day to the lab. And he still very much wants to see the ketone hypothesis proven. So anyway, future for that. I have to acknowledge Dr. Clark. That's the only picture I got of her. Uh, you have Dr. Arani, Ken Margulies, and right here is Ken Beatty, who's been at Penn now for 10 years. I hired him as my first hire uh, as an investigator with Ken Margulies, and he's still there uh, doing wonderful work with Dr. Margulies. So, um, so now we're just gonna do one thing, and then I have to acknowledge Dennis McGarry and, uh, uh, and, and Dan Foster. This guy was my chair of medicine, did morning report with us at Parkland every morning. We feared them for about six months and then we loved them <laughs> as interns. I can tell you that's, 
that's the best relationship you can have with a mentor, right? Uh, but these guys, legendary, and here is the great Dr. Krebs at UT Southwestern trying to convince some people from Parkland in the 1970s that, that uh, they didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> Good debate. All right, so, um, so now we have to talk about, real briefly, the last part of my talk here, and I'll, I can take questions probably for five minutes at the end. Um, is that going to be okay, or do you mean I can wrap up also in 10 minutes? Um, okay, so let me just talk about how I see now the assist model. So I, I, I talked about ketones as a potential future to do what? I think there may not be definitive therapies for heart failure because the heart, the heart like any organ that's trying to support, survive its challenges, whether it's exercise challenge, starvation challenges, failing challenges. When it's a fail, when under heart failure, the heart's challenged, right? Obviously, the heart is gonna keep adapting. So I believe that maybe it's an assist to doing what? To tolerating heart failure meds, which give you a durable result. We know that now, thank God. Thank God we have durability in heart failure treatment. Still not great. Patients still die, are hospitalized every day from heart failure, and it's gonna get worse because of the inflection with aging. And the other reason it's gonna get worse is because we're getting into a first world, I call it the first world crisis, right? So kind of like what Dr. Bronwell talked about with myocardial infarction, where people are surviving it, and now we have to manage them long-term for valve disease, for all kinds of things, secondary MR. Now we have to deal with people that are unbelievably managed by great cardiologists, but they're gonna come failing. They're gonna come failing. And I don't know what we're gonna do with 99% of these people, if you ask me. So, um, so again, I'm talking here more about RV as a very important, for me the RV and the pulmonary hypertension and the right ventricular dysfunction and heart failure is one of the hallmarks that I see for, um, for saying something's going, something not good is going on here. You know, uh, When you have pulmonary hypertension, you could have secondary, obviously, congestion, venous, pulmonary venous hypertension, reactive pulmonary vascular disease, all of it's bad. The bottom line is the RV is already taking a big hit, a big load. Um, this, this video doesn't work, but the bottom line is the RV is used to a low hydraulic impedance. It's a slim ventricle. It likes to just push against the low hydraulic impedance over time. It has a totally different pressure volume curve. And basically, here's, here's a, again, picture configuration of this is that you have a drop in the stroke volume for a very, very minimum change in the impedance. Whereas the left ventricle, a little more robust, bigger centroid mass, and so forth, right? So this is not gonna play, but the bottom line is we have to understand that the RV, the LV is the anchor for the RV, okay? I mean, the RV couldn't work. I know we have all this talk about Fontan physiology and all that, but Fontan patients are very special. Um, the LV is the anchor for the RV. When the LV starts to fail, the RV function is dropping. You, 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 you can see in acute MI, you can see a hypercontractile RV maybe as a response because you're catecholamine driven, but when you're losing major muscle and the LV is failing, the RV is going to start not working. Just that is one of the important lessons I've learned as a heart failure doc. You learn it very well in the LVAD world. We were talking yesterday with Vikram um, about that. And, and basically, you, you have a dropout of LV function, your RV is going to suffer. It has to. I'm, I'm very convinced of that. Now, double whammy. So that happens. And then what happens? Then you got congestion. <laughs> now the RV has to deal with a high load on because of the PA pressures, the pulsatile load. So now you have basically a scenario where the RV is just waiting to fail. So the, the, the progression of advanced heart failure is, is biventricular failure, right? It's what we see. It's what we sometimes can't do much about. So, um, so basically you have a way, again, uh, so in another assist, an, an assistance sometimes for us is, okay, do we need more data to manage patients on the outside so we can decongest them? Yes, I think cardiomems, let me just use PA sensors in general, because we have now two PA sensors. Uh, one is pending full approval. But PA sensors, I think, can make a difference. Other sensors may be coming that can make a difference, maybe measuring systemic venous congestion. The bottom line is in HEFPEF, you can absolutely have bad symptoms from small increases in, in volume, and, and you can really pressurize the ventricle and have a lot of um, uh, symptoms. And in HEFREF, I already talked about the chronic pulsatile load from the left side to the right side, the RV fails. So I'm just gonna fast forward here and say, this is, a, this is a study that I've put many times. It's a post hoc, post -hoc analysis of some of the early data from the Cardiomems data showing that even small changes 
in the delta pressure uh, translate into survival uh, and mortality. So you have on the group on the left, you have a drop in mortality because you actually have been decongesting them. And this just surprised nobody, right? Congestion is king in heart failure. Um, yes, it's important to know what the cardiac output is in shock, but congestion is king in heart failure. If we admitted every patient in a low cardiac output with heart failure, you wouldn't have enough hospital beds in the U.S. for, for the patients. You just wouldn't. Um, so, and now we have, again, another um, sensor, PA sensor, coming into hopefully full uh, market approval uh, with this system here. So, let me just say one thing about hospitalization briefly. We have way too many, right? <laughs> that's, everybody knows that everybody that's dealing with uh, hospital administration knows this is a conundrum. And if you have a really well-oiled heart failure team, you have a well-oiled uh, you know, communication with uh, you know, your hospitalist, you have a way you can actually impact and, uh, you know, with, um, um, with uh, our colleagues yesterday from heart failure, we're talking about the fact that you have to have maybe some protocols, but then have the ability as an advanced heart failure doctor to tailor uh, to the patient. Bottom line is a million hospitalizations in the U.S. yearly for heart failure. You would think it would be going down because we're getting better, right? It's not. It's the same. 2010, 2020, <laughs> 1 million in the U.S. 1.2 million. Why? It's what I said. The aging, aging is a big, age is becoming a huge risk factor for de novo heart failure. But the second reason, in my opinion, is we're getting good at keeping people alive with heart failure. They're going to come in when they're off by, because of viral illnesses and so forth and so on. Um, and again, obviously a determinant of mortality is that. So we need buttresses for assist. Um, I guess, I don't know if you guys think this is a good way to, I was thinking about this talk and I said, let's, let's, let's use buttresses, because you have pillars and buttresses. I, I like cathedrals. And um, here are the flying buttresses right here of Notre Dame, beautiful Our Lady here. The, so why are they there? Well, this is the, um, what is the name of this thing? I forgot the name of this thing. But this is the roof of the cathedral. Uh, this is really heavy, really heavy, right? I mean, they were, I mean this is, uh, you know, uh, back then, you know, metal, copper, all this stuff. And so these walls would actually potentially, you know, split apart. That's what those buttresses do. So think of the pillars heart failure medications that we know support heart failure. Buttresses are the assist so we can have the pillars work. That's the way I look at it. But if you like Steve Nash, uh, the assist. <laughs> Basically, think about the assist in heart failure. Dr. Guy helped me with many patients to assist them in heart failure. How? Mitral valve repair. Absolutely. Very important in our patients. Everybody? No. Um, but a good chunk don't even get seen for it at the right time. Um, could the, could the cardiac contractility modulation be an assist? This is just a quick uh, schema here. Uh, it's not prescriptive, it's not in the guidelines, uh, but I just wanna make sure you know for patients that have a narrow QRS, a lot of us in a very, very sick patient would be like, what are we gonna do for this patient? How can we get their heart rate from 120, their blood pressure's 80, to tolerate these meds? Maybe you gotta start thinking about some of these paradigms. Uh, again, not in the acute setting, right? Um, but in the maybe chronic ambulatory setting, like uh, Barostim. Um, and I'll talk later with Vikram uh, and, uh, and our colleagues here. Um, I know that you guys have some experience with Barostim. We're just starting our Barostim experience at Jefferson. We're gonna have our first implantations uh, on the 28th. Um, CCM, a uh, larger experience now in Philadelphia. Temple has led the, and, and, and the results are very impressive. Again, single center results that show us confidence to maybe use it in the right patient. Uh, this is cardiac contractility modulation. Um, and baroreceptor uh, stimulation. Um, so this is a quick, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up now on recovery. This is, a, this is one of my passions, is heart recovery. I was, uh, um, yesterday when talking with some of our colleagues here, I was telling them that, you know, when you're, when you're trying to figure out a vision for a center, a program, you know, you have to focus sometimes on what your passions are. And this was something that I was brought to Philadelphia to do is, do heart recovery and advanced heart failure. And I learned it from Chuck Hoops, a colleague of uh, Dr. Guy. I learned it from Dr. Hoops in UCSF early that y you can't transplant young people that are renegades. They'll, they'll all die. They'll, they'll fail. I mean, not all, but a lot of them are going to die. Uh, they have to listen to you. They have to be incredibly solid patients. So, so, so maybe you have a way when they're really sick, put an LVAD, reverse remodel the heart, and help them get better. 
Um, you'll have access to my slides. You can see these are the different, different phenotypes of heart recovery. I'm gonna focus on this one real quick. Cardi cardi chronic cardiomyopathy and DCM, as it progresses to the end stage, can it reverse, okay? And I'm talking about non-ischemic, um, right? So you're talking about, you know, an LVAD definitely reverses heart failure. The patients start to gain weight. That's what this ghost is supposed to be. Uh, the, the artist who did this for me, I said, please make the ghost a little less ghostly, and he didn't. But here's a guy that's supposed to gain weight on the LVAD. Uh, and basically, you have really solid data that we have. We at least have a pump that does, does have excellent long-term outcomes. So you can reliably say you can use it. It's got adverse events issues. We've not solved them. And I think that we're, at a very, we're very much at a point of, of plateau with enthusiasm for VADs, interestingly, throughout the world, not just uh, here in the US. Uh, maybe the, the field may be coming up with a couple pumps in the near future, very exciting pumps that may be able to reinvigorate it. I think we have to reinvigorate it by focusing on heart recovery. Because again, this is an assist device. Remember the assist model. Um, but anyway, we have great outcomes with VADs. I'm gonna show you now that Again, you can, and this is data from Dr. Burkhoff in the year 2000 with the big pumps with the HeartMate 1, you can make the heart go back to LV pressure volume properties. These are explanted hearts after they've gone through an LVAD or not, and you basically put them on a, on a, on a prep, and you're measuring their volume and their pressure. And the, and the properties of it are like, you know, like in the normal heart has a pressure volume relationship like this. This is a normal heart right here. Right, and then here's a failing heart. Huge heart starts to reverse remodel, but you need time. This is an LVAD assisted heart. And by the way, what happens with the RV? So the LV gives you the LVAD gives you mechanical unloading of the LV. That's part of the therapy. You don't get that on the RV side, and therefore he showed you don't get reverse remodeling on the RV unless you put an RVAD. So beautiful work again, showing that there's some pressure mechanics going on that give you a healing. So we did, we did work here with Emma Burks, and again, I have to credit Chuck Coops for giving me a lot of encouragement to help some of this work at UCSF. We had a lot of young, especially young undocumented patients at UCSF that we really had absolutely no, nothing we could do for them as far as transplant. So we, we took a risk on some of them, put LVADs. Some of them have survived several years after the LVAD was explanted. So this was a point of this study we did with Emma Burks, Reach Stage HF. What's the purpose of this? Take a bunch of centers that are really, really keen, enthusiastic, as Dr. Burks calls, and as a British person, she calls them aficionados <laughs> for recovery, get their surgeons to agree to explant when the criteria are met, and what happens? So we basically explanted 19 out of evaluable patients were actually 39, 38, because two, uh, two of our patients actually had early, uh, very significant problems with, at the implant period. So 19 out of 38 explanted, and, and the long-term data I'll show in a minute, but basically we excluded myocarditis, so this is not myocarditis recovery. We actually had a pathology core, no myocarditis, because then it's, you know, then, then you probably may not want to put the LVAD in. Maybe you want to just put a temporary device and let that person not undergo surgery. So these were chronic cardiomyopathy greater than a year, less than five years, non-ischemic age less than 50. And basically what we showed is you could really improve the EF in a lot of these patients. Um, with Vikram I said, you know, even though there is a notion that a very low percentage of patients do this, it depends what you're doing as a program, right? If you're taking everybody and you're trying to get them on meds, up, up the speed, as soon as you up the speed on an LVAD, that allows you to go up on the heart failure meds because the blood pressure is higher, right? You actually have an assist with that. You do that, you get the heart better, um, and then the question is, okay, you take the LVAD out, what happens long term? Thank God, there's still a failing rate, and I'll show a case of one of my patients when I got the pen that is now transplanted 11 years later. Um, but the bottom line is, this, this can be durable in terms of the horizon of four or five years. And, and that, that data is solid, probably from Restage and others. But the bottom line, here's the competing outcomes curves. These are patients that, basically, these patients were explanted for recovery at 50% rate. We had ongoing support in these patients. We transplanted these patients here from the original 40. Um, and I said the withdrawn of one patient was actually uh, one of our patients that had fulminant fungal infection, unfortunately, right after LVAD placement. We just couldn't do anything with her. Um, so I took the database at Penn for LVAT therapy and I said, well, what happens with everybody? And what if they're getting heart failure meds? And I found something interesting that we're about to publish, which is that you actually do have 
In those patients that got a beta blocker plus, I call it, so norhormonal blockade in LVAT patients can be, you could say, well, ACE inhibitor or ARB, but they're probably controlling the blood pressure. How about amlodipine? That's not, a, that's not heart failure therapy. So heart failure therapy for me was a beta blocker plus anything else, either aldactone, an ACE, ARB, ARNI. And if you were on it, these patients increased their EF from 14.5% to 22.7. You can see the difference between the blue and the red. Um, now, importantly, is that because they're healthier and they tolerate the medications, or is that because the meds do that? Um, a study from Utah actually found the same thing, association with all meds, increased DF. So I think this is an important study to do in the US by somebody, either an industry partner or NHLBI, to say, you take patients post LVAT and you randomize them to heart failure meds. It sounds crazy, and some places wouldn't do it because they quote unquote already treat their patients maximally, but I would argue, you know, do you push the beta blocker? How much do you push it? Those things can be fine-tuned in a protocol, and I still think that should be studied. So this is the patient. I'm going to conclude with this. This is uh, Ron Winslow wrote an article about us in 2013 in the Wall Street Journal. And it was really about a patient. Uh, and, and then Emma Burks was in here. Uh, Joe, Joe Wu got in here. Uh, our surgeon definitely got a chance to, to, to have a picture taken. Uh, this was the... Um, article about how the heart can heal apparently from an end stage. And I say apparently end stage, why? Because well, you can't call it end stage if you've gotten DF back to 50%, right? I mean, something, either you misdiagnosed end stage heart failure or you did something that was novel, right? So we think we did something that was novel. This is the patient I met literally in my first two weeks at Penn. My wife had just delivered. And here's this South Philly guy swearing at his parents. Uh, I come into the room and, and he literally is, I mean, He's a wonderful man, just Joey Bilateri, but he was literally telling his parents to get the you-know-what out of the room when I got in. Um, I knew I could not trans we couldn't transplant this patient, so we put him through a protocol, not restage, this was before, of HARPS using a hair field protocol with an LVAD and clenbuterol, a beta-2 agonist that was used to, uh, to improve uh, you know, skeletal muscle function in horse, horse breeding, horse racing. Uh, and this was Sir Magdi Yacoub from England doing this with Emma Burks. He was the only patient in the U.S. that got it. The protocol ended because we couldn't get clenbuterol. I think the, I think the horses needed clenbuterol more than humans. We never were able to get clenbuterol back for humans. But basically, this guy was explained. This is his trajectory. We explained him at two years. He was born with a cardiomyopathy. He was born, in, he was born and sent over to CHOP early because he had a dilated cardiomyopathy. And then they treated him for years. Uh, my partner, Dr. Wall, treated him with heart failure therapies. He went to college at age 18, stopped all his meds, and he came in at age 19, and that's when he crashed. So we elevated him. His EF came up, was explanted. He survived and did really well explanted until he was actually transplanted in 2022. That's 10 years. That's, that's about 13 years we gave this guy with an LVAD plus recovery. Why is that important? Because you would have transplanted a 20-year-old. He could be failing by now. He just got his transplant, and it was, uh, and he looks great. Um, and I will say that Joey wanted to always be a Marine. Uh, I told him I couldn't write any letters uh, embellishing his, his cardiac condition, but, uh, but that I told him he had the biggest heart that I've ever, ever met. Anyway, so that's, that's it. And I, I want to just put one, one last thing here about um, collaboration. I mean, I've really collaborated with some really wonderful people. I'm so thankful for them. Um, Dr. Gibbon, and Sloan knows about this, we're gonna be celebrating the jubilee of Dr. Gibbon at Jefferson, I hope, in November at the HA. We have a program that is being set up where we're talking about the history of cardiac surgery with its origins of the cardiopulmonary bypass. The first successful cardiopulmonary bypass was done on, I think, May 6th or May 3rd, 1953. May 6th. Um, yeah, May 6th, 1953, at Jefferson. Uh, the irony is the OR where he did it happens to be the office of the department chair of medicine on the old building. Uh, so I told the department chair of medicine, Greg Kane, I said, Greg, I mean, you realize this is hallowed ground. He's like, I know, I know. We have this little plaque here <laughs> of how this happened. I mean, this is the first cardiopulmonary bypass run in a young woman who had an ASD repair. And Dr. Gibbon collaborated. In fact, he gave his Gibbon idea and his, I mean, the, the cardiopulmonary um, uh, machine, the, uh, the oxygenator and the pumps were actually donated uh, to Minnesota, and then Dr. Kirkland took it, and that became the given Mayo 
pump that actually led cardiac surgery into an early era of incredible. So anyway, these, this, this timeline continues, and I want to just thank, this is our MCS director, Dr. Raja Prayar Indrani came to join us. Um, we recruited her highly, and she came from UAB. She's amazing. Uh, one of the smartest people that I've worked with. Dr. Massey, I thank him so much for what he's done to our center, um, stabilizing the heart failure transplant program, but also being uh, just an incredible colleague. Um, and again, you know, for us, at Jefferson at least, you know, we're trying to be a team. A team is very important, but you know, for the patient, timing and tailor, so sometimes the team gets into arguments about timing and what we're doing, but that's okay. As long as you're team oriented, you stick together for that. And I'm just gonna finally say about these other colleagues, Renee Alvarez, who recruited me along with Ro Morris, who recruited both me and Dr. Guy. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you very much. I do have a picture of Dr. Guy here, by the way. I, I, I saved it, uh, just, but I know he's here now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rami, for that uh, really enlightening uh, discussion. I uh, really learned a lot from that uh, conversation. Um, so just real quick, I wanted to open it up to see if there's any questions in the audience. I see Jamie's already up there. Yeah, thanks, Eddie, for an excellent presentation. I think I got something very clear that uh, heart failure is a cardiometabolic disorder, so thank you for that. And uh, <laughs> moving on to the cardio, to the actually my cardial energetics theory and, and uh, Subhad Ram, uh, um uh, Verma and their investigators in Ontario feel very strongly that the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors is actually on the beta hydroxybutyrate being a, neck, a great fuel for the myocardium. So translating that into our clinics, if a patient comes to our cardiometabolic clinic, he's diabetic, he's on an SGLT2 inhibitor because of heart failure, but there's still some additional benefits, weight loss, A1C control, triglycerides. Would adding an SGLT2 inhibitor, you think it will wash off the beneficial effects of uh, I'm adding a GLP-1 agonist will wash all question. the effects of the SGLT2. So it's funny, Jamie, that I'm having this question when I have a metabolic colleague. Uh, Sloan may remember this, this person who's actually Lebanese, uh, Dr. Carillos, and she's tough. She's our bariatric person at Jefferson, and, and she's amazing. She's an internist, passionate bariatric. She's like, Eduardo, um, but what if they're morbidly obese? I said, I, I, I think there's probably a role for both bariatric surgery and GLP-1 in those patients, but we have no data. So what would you add it? Um, if someone is having, again, you know, life-limiting obesity, I think you have to consider it. Um, you know, I'm talking a little bit more in the GLP-1 era for like when they were using, Jamie, for diabetes control, GLP-1, not so much weight loss. And I see these people with advancing heart failure, and we know the fight study results. And, and again, I, I mean, my colleagues know as long as we're collaborative, we talk to each other, we should influence each other's practice for the benefit of the patient. Have I proven that withdrawing the GLP-1 made them better? You know, I get a very sick bunch of patients seen uh, like you in clinic. I can't tell you that, but I feel like it's an important safety warning, but it's a great question. I would answer it as, you know, I would try a GLP-1 and follow the patient closely. Uh, and I, I kind of had a follow-up question on that because you know, when we look at SGLT2 data, for example, we know there's specific sometimes drug effect, there's specific to specific molecules. So for example, we know there's increased risk of uh, amputations with canagliflozin, but it's not a class effect. So the question is, when you look at a five study with liraglutide, you know, does that translate, for example, to semaglutide, right? So we've, there's pretty good data that semaglutide um, impacts, you know, for example, the um, you know, cytokinetics of the uh, of the failing myocardium uh, helps improve the immune system function, and so so there's some good basic data that semaglutide as a molecule actually has good positive impact on failing myocardium. So I'm not sure what your no. response to that. To that. You, you know, just it's a great question. I I did a very rough brush. You know, my this was a painting, right? A brush stroke of a mechanism. I I used one trial to say be aware of these data. Um, I would agree with you. I would say well done trials need to be done. They're doing a HEFPEF trial with GLP-1. Um, and maybe by reducing obesity, you will improve six minute walk and those things. I hope it's a positive trial. If it's a neutral trial, despite weight loss, I would, I would start thinking about the old Rame hypothesis. I'm just joking. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you my, I don't know enough about the GLP-1 biology. I was really insightful what you told me about some of these mechanisms. 
I do know that there was a guy who was a, our chair, our chief of cardiology, Rick. Oh gosh. So what was his name? What was our chief of cardiology when you came to, uh, when you, um, he was a, he was a chief cardiologist. He was the, uh, pharmacy was our chief of cardiology, but our chair of medicine at, at Penn was also a cardiologist. Rick, he would then became a Dean at UVA. Uh, 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 anyway, he, he really had a lab that looked at insulin resistance. He was big on canine models of insulin resistance in heart failure and really thought the GLP one hypothesis was going to be a winner. Um, and, and, and I would ask, I would ask him what his thoughts are these days, but, but I would, I would, I would say it's important to study that. And so if you have an opportunity, especially with these companies having incredible, you know, bandwidth, as long as you stay very uh, unconflicted, I, I think it's really important to study this. And I don't know if the companies want to study it. Fight was a really good study guys. It was done by the network. Not, I, I was actually not an investigator in fight. It was uh, preceded me, Dr. Coppola, Tom Coppola, Ken Margulies wrote it. I came in and just helped recruit and I got the pen, but I was very involved in looking at the data because I was really, obviously intrigued because of the work I was doing. And um, you can't find a positive, a positive result in fight, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, typically in cardiology, we recommend the Mediterranean diet to our patients. Are you a proponent of the ketogenic diet? Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. If you ask, so you saw that lady with the hat. So that's Kieran Clark. She's very opinionated as, as a lot of Brits are. She's actually from New Zealand. Dr. Clark would say that ketogenic diet is going to make you feel really, it's interesting because you're mobilizing with ketogenic diet, that free fatty acids. And she thinks, obviously she's conflicted because she's the inventor of Delta G, but you know, she'd say ketogenic diet for some incredible for others. Some people actually on a ketogenic diet, I don't know if you've seen People say, oh, just you're, you're dehydrated. Take more water. They feel very tired because free fatty acids at a high level of uh, free fatty acids, they, they can they can impact um, lots of end organs. Um, I wish we could study a ketogenic diet in heart failure. Maybe there are some studies. I, I have not looked at it, actually. We have another question back here, and this will be our last question. Today. Good morning. Um, I would like to know about your thoughts regarding uh, fasting and do you recommend intermittent fasting because it has like the same mechanism like you discussed. Thank you. I do think that, um, again, I'm not someone who knows a lot about nutrition. I'm going to be very honest about this, but I do think we need to understand better um, the benefits for some individuals who may just, you know, be really good with a 15 hour, 16 hour fast two meals a day. These studies are so essential. I mean, I mean, our population, not just because of obesity, but the heart diseases. I mean, it's crazy. I know it's, I know we're all employed by it, but it's, it's crazy. You know, if you think about it, I mean, undiagnosed heart disease and what, what these young people are going through, I would love to see a good fasting study. I do know that in animal models, caloric restriction, those rats live forever. <laughs> I don't know why. And probably the, you know, our ancestors in the desert, when they fasted, they probably were able to live longer because of something that was going on. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, uh, for coming out to this great round rounds, and we appreciate your support and everything. Thank you. <laughs>